Matthew chapter 13. I want to begin reading with verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared, appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now the question is this, will everybody that goes to church go to heaven? Will every member of this church make it to heaven? I would like to think that if the rapture would occur here on a Sunday morning, that this room would be completely emptied. But according to this parable, that might be unlikely. Now, this is a simple par parable, but it carries with it a very profound truth. And it goes like this. A farmer sowed good seed on good ground. But while he slept, an enemy comes along and sows tares among the wheat. Now, a tear in those days was a poisonous weed that looks a lot like wheat in the early stages. And if it would have been eaten by a person or an animal, nausea would occur along with convulsions and in circumstance, some circumstances, even death from these tares. This was a very spiteful act of malice. And the enemy here had absolutely nothing to gain except to ruin the wheat crop of the farmer. Now, when his workers realized what had been done, they asked him, said, should we pull these tares out? And he said, no, it's easier to tell the difference between the wheat and tares at harvest time. We'll bring the wheat into the barn, but we're going to separate those tares and we're going to put them in the bundles and we're going to burn them. Now, the interpretation of this parable is found in verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus Christ made it crystal clear what this parable meant. Amen. You don't have to try to decipher it. I mean, he lays it out in black and white. And it's not hard to understand what Jesus is saying here in this parable. But I want us to go a little bit deeper in these applications and ramifications of these things. Now, there's three elements that we're going to look at here this morning. So the first one I want to look at is what I call the sowing. The sowing. A sowing of the wheat. And in verse 37, we see that Jesus is the farmer. And the next verse points out that the wheat are the believers. Wheat and Christians have something in common. First of all, wheat doesn't have a very deep root system. Wheat doesn't go very deep compared to how high it gets. And it's very easily pulled up by the roots. 
Well, I could say it like this. We is not firmly attached to this world. The same ought to be true of us when it comes to this world. And many have become so attached to this world that they have a hard time giving up anything when it comes to serving God and building his kingdom. But one day soon, <coughs> and it might be today, a summons is going to sound in the sky and we're going to leave in the twinkling of an eye. And if you have a nice home and a nice car, that's fine, but don't get too attached to them because you can't take them with you. And you're not going to need them where you're going and you'll never miss them. Amen. 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 And only what we've done for Christ will matter. I can remember back before I became a Christian, it was my goal to make a lot of money as a contractor and build a lot of houses and retire and not have to worry about a thing. That was my goal. Not much of a goal, is it? Then one day, a very good friend of mine by the name of Ron Sylvester, he lived over here in Newark, over by the Air Force Base, and he had a airplane. He said, Jim, you want to take a ride in my plane? I said, you better believe it. So we went over there. He put me in his plane, and we were flying around. He goes, where do you want to go? I said, would it be too much to go down and fly over top of my house at Lancaster? Now, at that time, I had a new home that I built and had five acres of ground, and I thought I was on my way to being financially secure. So he took me. Now, we're up. I don't know how many feet we're up in the air, but I looked down, and that house looked about like this. And that five acres, I could literally see the outline of that five acres where I kept it mowed. And the whole thing looked about like this. And I said, Ron, would you look at this? People are killing one another over that little square down there. And it wasn't until then I realized that a new home and property and money really didn't mean a whole lot when it came to eternity. And right then and there, my goal changed. Now I'm, my goal is to build the kingdom of God and get as many people ready as I can to spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ in the home that he has built for them. <clears throat> now, we're talking about wheat and we're talking about tares. The second thing I want you to understand, wheat doesn't last very long. Wheat grows and then it ripens and it bears its fruit and very quickly it passes off the scene. And when we get saved, we'll grow in grace and bear what fruit God wants us to bear and quickly we're going to fade away too. Now, I don't know how long you and I are going to live, but until God is through with us, not a hair on our heads can be touched. And after God is done with us, there ain't an anchor in this world can hold us back when God wants to take us home. And one day, I'm going to preach my very last sermon. And then I'm out of here, not to go off to another church, but off to another world. One day, you're going to get up and do the things that you usually do for the last time. You won't realize it's the last time until you're flying away in the air. But you just did those things for the last time. And God didn't leave us here just to take up space, but to accomplish certain things for him and to bear fruit for him. Thirdly, wheat grows upward and dies downward. And we too ought to become more and more alive to things above and dead to the things which are below. Now the Apostle Paul put it like this, set your affections on things above, not on things on earth. But for whatever reason, even God's children can't get that taken care of. It amazes me what a man who calls himself a Christian will do just to have a little bit of money in his pocket. It amazes me. I've been self-employed my entire life, my whole life. And I've worked for people before that have been a little bit shady and I just walk away. And all the other Masons that were in Lancaster say, Vanover, you gave up a lot of good money. I said, no, I gave up a lot of foolishness. I said, I don't even want to be associated with that man. I won't work for a, a, a builder 
that does shady work. I won't do it. I don't want to be associated with it. But I got a reputation in Lancaster for being honest and being fair. And I was proud of that reputation. But the rather reputation I more want in my life is to know that I'm a man of God. Amen. A man of God. Now listen. Number four. Wheat has a head on it. When it's mature, it begins to bow. Now you know where I'm going with this one, don't you? What a beautiful picture here. At maturity, the head of the wheat becomes full of grain and it just slumps over. But the tares will continue to grow upright. The bow of the wheat is symbolic of humbleness as it grows to maturity. And the tares are symbolic of pride, refusing to bow in humbleness, never grow into maturity. It bears the closest resemblance to wheat until the ear on the wheat appears, or the head. You can barely tell them apart, just like Christians and non-Christians, just like Christians and fake Christians. It's hard to tell them apart. But when Jesus sends the angels to reap the harvest on the last day of our lives, only he will be able to make the difference. Amen. And then it's going to be too late. Well, being bearing more fruit for the Christians should not lead to pride, but to humility. But for many, success doesn't cause the head to bow. It causes the nose to rise. I've been in churches before where pastors walked around with their nose straight up in the air. And I asked one one day, did your feet stink? <laughs> and his nose came in, what do you mean by that? I go, we are walking around with your nose up. If you can't stand to smell your feet, I know I can't either. You know, I was always getting in trouble for that. Well, now let's, that's the sowing of the, of the seed. Let's look at the sowing of the tares for a minute. Verse 25 tells us that the enemy came by night and sowed these tares right among the wheat. Well, who are the tares? Well, look at the end of verse 38. Jesus said it's the children of the wicked one. They're the tares. Remember that the next time you hear somebody trying to reconcile Islam with Christianity... Making the common, uh, they make this thing. Well, we're all God's children. No, we're not. Listen to me. We're all God's creation, but we're not all his children. If you remember, Jesus said of the Pharisees, you of your father, the devil. We're not all God's children. You become God's child when you accept his son, Jesus Christ, as your personal savior and your Lord. Then and only then will you become a child of God. Well, there are two family lines on earth. Some have been born once and others have been born twice. You're born first of all physically. You're born into your parents' family, and you had no say-so in that. It happened without your consent. But God wants you to be born into his family. That is a spiritual birth, and it can only happen with your consent. So thank God. You, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you were born the first time. But I'm more concerned, have you been born the second time? Spiritual birth into the family of God. You got to be born again, and Jesus is the way. Now that sounds narrow and politically incorrect, and I have no desire, desire to be narrow except for where God the Creator is narrow. And I'd rather be biblically correct any day than politically correct. And so we got the sowing. Secondly, we've got the growing. The growing. So we got the children of God, and we got the children of the devil living together in the field of the world. And the interesting thing is, they both look an awful lot alike on the outside. Just, become, just because somebody tells you they're a Christian doesn't mean they are. I'm going to get into that just a little bit here. I'd like to get into it more than I'm going to, but for the sake of time, I can't. What are we being taught here? 
Well, here it is. The devil attacks the kingdom of God by infiltration and by planting imitators in the church. That's how he gets a foothold. And here's what, listen to me. I want you to listen to this very carefully. These imitators might even, might not even know that they're imitator. They really think they're going to heaven. Now that'll baffle your head if you think about it a little bit. But I'll tell you what, Satan knows and God knows they're counterfeit Christians. Paul called them false brethren. They're fakes and phonies, but eventually their true callers show through. And in the meanwhile, they can be poison to a church. And for this reason, that's why we're very careful who we allow to become members of our church. A lot of pastors, if you've got a pulse, you're in. Not me. If you can't tell me how you know you're saved and on your way to heaven, you're not becoming a member of this church. Amen? Amen. Amen. We need to know their testimony and what they trust in for salvation. They cannot be members unless they're members of the kingdom of God. There's 160 million members of churches in America today. Are they all born again? I wish they were. Boy, this would be a Christian nation if they were. And we wouldn't be in this mess that we're in today. What kind of a mess? Well, first of all, abortion's on the rise, teen pregnancy, cohabitation, divorce, suicide, drugs and alcohol. And I'm talking about the church just as much as I am the world. They're in both in almost the same numbers. Now, won't that baffle you? I told you when I first got saved, I was working for a, a couple of weeks. I worked for a guy... And chill a coffee, doing odd jobs in people's homes. And I got in the home of this guy that was supposed to be rude. I mean, he had the collar and all this stuff around his neck. I thought, oh, here's a godly man. You got to understand, I was an alcoholic when I accepted Jesus. And he took that stuff away from me. And I come into his house, and the first thing he did was open his refrigerator and offer me a beer. I just... I, I, I just stood there. I froze. I thought, this can't be. This is supposed to be a man of God. And I had a hard time with that. And I remember I called a the, the, couple of the guys that won me to the Lord, and I shared that with them. He said, Jim, not everybody that says they're a Christian is a Christian. God took that away from me. Listen to me. Jesus took those nails in his hands and his feet and took those stripes on his back and that crown of thorns to free me from that stuff. Would I crucify him all over again by going back to it? No. I've been set free. I don't need that anymore. Billy Graham said his greatest mission field has been the roll books of the churches. He said 70% of the people that get saved under his ministry are church members. They were tares among the wheat, but they got saved. So what we got? We got sowing and growing. Thirdly, we got the mowing. God's going to get his mower out someday. Now, the question is, what good will pride do you in hell? Amen? I know people are too proud to get saved. I had a guy say, well, I got too much to give up to get saved. I got, no, you got too much to gain to not get saved. All I gave up was a hangover. Huh? I don't think I gave up too much. Boy, what I gained. Remember now, the tares look and act just like wheat. They carry their Bible, 
They pray, they sing songs, they might even have a job in the church. But what are they trusting in for their salvation? Sadly, in many cases, they trust in their being a good person or a church member or being baptized. But that won't save you. You get baptized without being a Christian, two things are going to happen. Number one, you're going to go under the water a dry Christian number, or dry sinner. Number two, you're going to come out of the water a wet sinner. That's the only difference. Baptism don't save you, never has, and it never will. A relationship with Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on that cross, he said, it is finished. What is it? Redemption's plan has been finished in full at Calvary. Amen? It's by the blood. Without the blood, there is no remission of sin. And so I need to ask you this question. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die in 10 minutes, that you would go to heaven? Because if you don't know, you're not going. Jesus made it crystal clear how we can know beyond any shadow of a doubt that when we die, we'll go to heaven. And it's not by feeling. If you're waiting for some feeling, forget it. I'm saved according to the word of God. That's how I know. I don't always feel saved all the time. I don't feel like doing things at the church all the time. But I do them anyway because God saved me to serve him. How many of you feel like getting up and going to work every morning? But you do it, don't you? Now, if we'll get up and go to our secular jobs, why can't we get up and serve the Lord? Amen? Good preaching, Vanover. That's good stuff. So the question is, you've got to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Now, I'm not trying to shake anybody's faith here this morning. I'm trying to proclaim the truth of Jesus' parable here for your sakes. If you have assurance, who in the world am I to doubt it? And if you don't have assurance, who am I to give you assurance if you don't have it? I mean, the Lord might come back at any time. You don't have all the time in the world. Listen to me. The mowing that's coming is imminent. God the reaper, or God is the reaper, and the truth is the grim. One day God's going to thrust in his sharp sickle and harvest this earth, and he alone is able and capable of telling the difference between the wheat and the tares. Those Pharisees that Jesus said that they were of their father, the devil, they thought they were okay with God. I mean, they did everything right down the line religiously. I'll tell you what, you can have religion. I don't think religion's worth a plug nickel. What I'm after is a relationship. <laughs> Guys, listen to me. I'm going to say this and then I'm done. I've said this a thousand times here at this church. When I said yes to Jesus that day, something happened. Amen. Something happened to me. I was sitting in the third row back on the end at Faith Memorial. That altar was just as close as this one is. And I remember sitting there with those tears going down. I said, Jesus, I don't want to make a promise to you that I can't keep. I can't do it. I can't live this kind of a life. And I remember what Jim Daff told me when he was sharing the Bible with me. He said, Jim, it's not you making the promises, as much as it is Jesus. He said, if you'll receive him, he will give you the power to live that kind of life. I didn't have the power. That's why I couldn't live it. I remember saying in that seat, okay, God, you promised I'm going. You said you'd give me the power. Here I go. However, I ran to that altar, sobbed, and something, it felt like the top of my head was on fire. And I've never been the same. Never been the same. And I gained so much. 
Our kids are going to heaven now. My grandkids are going to heaven. What if I wouldn't have said yes to Jesus that day? All they would have seen was an old drunk. That's all my kids and grandkids would have ever known. And they may have never made it. I certainly wouldn't be here today preaching this sermon. The wheat and the tares. When was the last time you examined yourself and made sure you're not a tear? One way to know, if you can go out here and cheat somebody, you're a tear. And you can cheat somebody and it not bother you. If you can do business dealings and be a little shady about it and it doesn't bother you, you're a tear. Because my Bible says, do all that you do as unto the Lord. When I do a job for somebody, when I built that chimney for Roxy this week, I wasn't doing that for Roxy. I was doing it for Jesus. Amen. Every time I lay a block, I said, Jesus, here's another one. Finally, I laid that last block. I said, I hope you like this, Jesus. My brother-in-law there goes, fan over who you talking to up here. I said, you wouldn't know him. <laughs> Do you know him? Amen. Here's what Jesus said. Now listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. You remember what Jesus said in that day? Many would come to him and say, but Lord, we've done all these things in your name. Look what we did for you. I'm a Christian, Jesus. Look what I did. And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Could that be anybody in this room today? I pray to God it isn't. I'd like to think you've heard enough of the gospel in here to know whether or not you're right with the Lord. The Bible says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. And you do that by the Word of God. Let's stand. Thanks for joining us. Please like and subscribe to our channel. Also, follow us on the Mixler app and on Facebook. Or visit our website, lighthousememorial.com. God bless.